All right. So this presentation is has three parts. First of all, I'm going to try to explain why I think visual programming is important, uh, and what's the problem with traditional coding, from my point of view. Um, then I'm going to give a bit, brief overview of different varieties of, of uh, visual programming systems. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my own project, Weld. So, as I mentioned before, I have a background in, in the gaming industry. I've been working as a game designer, doing mobile games, PC games. Um, then, after a while, moving more into uh, uh, apps and, and the web and, and, uh, and uh, mobile stuff. So this was an sort of exercising gaming product I, I did a couple years back. Um, and recently, when I was on paternity leave, I did a little parental inspiration app called uh, Fun with Kids, or Scoring Me Bond, for example. So, I've been sort of drifting. My, my technology interest has risen last year, so I've been becoming more interested in coding and making, making software. And um, I'm, I'm a pretty bad programmer, actually, uh, but I love creating software. So that's a big reason for my <clears throat> interest in this. And um, usually when I, when I um, start thinking of a piece of software or an app I want to create, uh, I think along these lines, sort of I have a, an idea, a vision of how it should be like. Um, but then at one point or another, I have to go through this step. And to me, that's a, it kills my, my inspiration. Um, and um, it's not only the, the transforming my, de my ideas into code, but it's often um, usually sort of setting up the development environment takes half a day. Uh, I spend two days configuring my deployment environment. Uh, every time I, uh, like every time I think it's time to um, brush off my um, iPhone coding skills, I need to download and install, learn a new version of Xcode. Um, and that, that's just tedious. I want to sort of quick, more quickly move to the actual creation of software. Um, a big inspiration of mine is like this guy. He's called Brett Victor. He's a um, usability designer. He, he used to work at Apple. He has, a lot of, has done a lot of thinking about design of, of, of software and things. And you should really check out his presentations on, on Vimeo. They are great. Um, and if you have, have seen his talks, you will recognize some of, of the ideas I, I will be talking about. So, let's say I have an idea of, of, of a piece of software and I want to create. I, I have this idea in my head, I want to sort of transfer that idea, that experience to, uh, to uh, a user. And I want that experience to come across as unfiltered, as untransformed as possible. It shouldn't end up like that. Um, and there's a, there's a model for, for uh, this kind of um, messaging, uh, Shannon's communication model. So if I'm the information source, I'm creating something, I have it goes to a transmitter, a channel, receiver, destination, tra transforming this to maybe software uh, and other media. I would be the designer, I, I work with a tool, it goes through a physical medium, which could be the internet or a disk or something. Um, the user will experience it on a platform. And so here's my idea. But then the problem is, going through the step, that's, that's, it's a big filter for me. And uh, I, I feel I lose a lot of uh, information and, and a big chunk of experience in that process. And, and then you might say, but don't do that yourself then. Uh, let someone else do that and um, find someone that can do the coding for you. But that's a bit of the same problem to me because I can go through a designer and then a programmer and then finally the experience will end up with the user. But I'm confident things will be lost at each step here uh, from my original vision. And I'm not 
alone with this thought, actually. Uh, I'm stealing a quote from Dan Ingalls, who invented or helped inventing small talk. He says that if a system is to serve the, the creative spirit, it must be entirely com comprehensible to a single individual. Um, and I think that actually goes beyond that every piece of software should be written by one person. It's more that if a system is simple enough and simple to understand enough uh, that one person can understand it, then sort of it's easier to communicate about this as well. To, so to sum up my, uh, sort of why, why I'm interested in this, I believe that great ideas get lost in the tra translation to code. And I think that uh, creators should not be forced to think like computers. It should be the other way around. I also think that ideas can get lost when transferred between people. And um, there's, there is value of having a system that where one person can create uh, an application by her or himself. OK, so now we move into um, the next part. Um, and I've been trying, I've been reading about this and trying to, to think about ways of creating behavior without using code. And one is flow based or node based, where you create sort of diagrams of, of um, behavior chunks and you tie them up with, with um, links. Um, one, uh, another aspect is. Um, Link parameters is, is so tiny, I, I don't even, we'll, won't even dig into that. But smart components, uh, I'm thinking maybe the way that, um, if you remember uh, Visual Basic. Uh, in Visual Basic you had, um, you could create a, your form, you had a little text box and a button, but then you could, you could buy or you could download uh, ActiveX plugins that could sort of contain really sophisticated functionality like uh, um, you could have a chat component or a printer component or a mapping component and you could just drag it in and you could set up a few properties on it and it would just work um, without any coding involved. Um, then you have the sort of fill in the blanks templates um, where you don't have to write code in text but you have sort of code blocks where, where, you, where it's evident where which parameters can be changed. Uh, systems like um, Scratch um, use that. I'll, I'll show you some screenshots on that uh, later on. Then we have the sort of step-by-step -step recording uh, that was very popular in the 90s. In, if you had Excel, you could sort of press record and you could um, do some some operations on your spreadsheet and then you press stop and you save it and you could do that over and over again. Uh, and you could also manipulate, it, it produced actually code, so you could manipulate it afterwards. But that's one way of transferring sort of behavior from a person to a computer. And then um, natural language input, either text, textual or voice, or it could be, could be analyzed by computer or analyzed by, by a person. Um, and then there probably are others. Uh, if you, any spontaneous other ideas that you think of that isn't covered by this. Why not state data maybe? Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Write that down. <coughs> like a state machine? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how is an Excel sheet, for example, is that too much code based or um, kind of mixing structure and colonies. No, I, I, I don't think it's by, by default it's too much code. It, it's, it's, I think it's more how you, the way you work with it. I think if when you um, uh, create a sophisticated spreadsheet and you're tying up cells with each other and using functions and so on, I think that's um, pretty straightforward for most people. But when you record a macro, and you try to sort of define a flow of, of events with the sort of Excel language, that becomes very hard to, even for a program, it becomes hard to read and, and understand what's going on. Be, it's almost like a forced behavior. But, yeah. I, but I, I like the sort of um, um, Excel model of sort of linking. There's a word for that um, where you sort of tie things to each other, and when you change one thing, it sort of just goes like a mm -hmm. cascading. Reactive program? Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
I, I like that approach. I'm um, thinking of uh, in the Sublime Edit there is this multiple cursors. Right? Yeah. This is a bit similar to macros, but it's you're running several the same macro in parallel, basically. Okay, but you are the macro in a way. You, it's you, still you typing, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, I use it the same way I used macros before. Okay. It's more, it's more obvious when you're making a mistake or something that you can see the results. Yeah, I, I think the sort of the direct manipulation is really important. I think in, in many many things, and and uh, like I, I agree with you. I, I like even if I select. If I have 10 cursors in a, in a document and I start typing, I still feel I have more control compared to if I do like a find and replace all. Uh, so I, I agree with you. I, I did a little attempt of, of creating sort of um, a graph. Um, and I invented two uh, axes here. Um, so one is the, the x axis is about sort of what, what the input is in, into the system. One is on the one end, you have more uh, textual input, uh, where the, the screen would be sort of regular coding. Uh, and the other extreme is visual input, where you would just draw things or, or uh, use images in different ways. And on, then on the, on the y-axis, you have um, more visually output. And, and visually, I mean sort of things that are rendered to a screen, maybe uses sound and so on. Uh, and on the other aspect, you have non-visual output maybe you think that they're just processed in the background, uh, could control maybe a um, physical thing or something like that. Um, there are probably pretty, uh, a lot of things to, to argue about when you, when you see how I place things there on the map. But, but anyway, um, so I'm placing a lot of things here and we'll cover most of them in the, in the talk. But, um, so there, there isn't that much in the textual non-visual output box because that's most common programming language would probably fit in that box. But there are three clusters that I can can see in the screen. One is sort of what I call the game builders. They are they are very heavy on, on visual input and, and the outcome is very visual as well. So you have um, uh, Kodo. Um, I forgot to include a coding screenshot, but Kodo is a, it's a Microsoft invented programming language designed to be uh, used with a game controller. So you basically, you, you, it's, it's icon based and you select things from a menu and there's no text at all. Um, Alice is a 3D environment, programming environment. There is um, sort of a fill in the blanks template programming. Scratch is similar but 2D. Uh, Game Maker is, you can still code in it, but uh, a lot of a lot of the uh, how you work with it is sort of managing the, the, the graphics assets and configuring the, configuring them and so on. And then you have a second cluster down here, which is the, the flow based. Uh, I just meant, oh, sorry, uh, uh, the app builders um, to uh, to the left, and you have Visual Basic. You have Microsoft Access, um, and more recent examples like Caspio, which is a website where you can, can create sort of data-driven forms and reports. Uh, and then uh, Apri, I.O. and Codica are, are more recent examples of how you make mobile apps um, from a, and, and can compile them to different platforms. And then we have Flow-based, where you have a very visual way of creating the behavior, but you might not have uh, a visual output. It could be just data, uh, data streaming or something running in the background. And I will show with a, a few screenshots of this. So we'll start with the app builders. Um, visual Basic is, uh, is an old example. Uh, I, I used Visual Basic myself a lot when it, when it, when it was popular. I guess it was sort of killed by the web uh, because uh, didn't, no one wanted to use desktop applications anymore. Mm -hmm. I think it was brilliant for what it did. Uh, it had a tendency to, to um, create, uh, when it would create something bigger, it was very hard to maintain it, but, but uh, for creating simple desktop apps, it was really quick to use. 
CASP is a more recent example. This is um, a web-based tool where you create, looks very similar to access, uh, Microsoft Access, create uh, web-based data forms and reports. I haven't used it myself. Um, then we have Appri and, and Codica. Both, both of them are web-based tools uh, where you uh, can create mobile uh, applications and you can compile them. Uh, Appri can compile the different uh, native uh, platforms. Codica exports uh, mobile, uh, a mobile uh, web app. And then you have uh, Fliplet and Operatio. They are more, they're more like uh, cross-platform content creation tools. They almost do not fit in this spectrum because they, uh, they are very light on the behavior side. You, can, you can't really add that much, much functionality to them um, beyond a few sort of predefined components that you can strap on. Uh, and they produce sort of uh, a, a native I, uh, iPad or Android app for them. And then you have game builders. And uh, I'll quickly just mention Smalltalk, uh, because Smalltalk was, was, um, has nothing to do with games, uh, I admit that, but um, it was a, a first way of, of um, <laughs> creating um, a structure of code and creating places where code should be in a way that wasn't defined, that wasn't present before. Um, and you have sort of this, this browser down here where you can sort of find your uh, the structure of your application and you can sort of put in little chunks of code uh, where it was supposed to be. Uh, and Smalltalk is also the basis of eToys, which is a very, it's an interesting project. I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's good or great, but it's interesting to use. It's a visual environment for creating simple games uh, it's built on Smalltalk, and um, it, it's a very visual tool. Uh, it's quite powerful because they have actually built their 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 uh, editing environment in in eToys itself, uh, which is they they are quite um, uh, they think that's an important feat to themselves, the, the creators of this. But personally, I think this is a very hard tool to use. Um, and I think it sort of misses the point of making vision programming accessible. It, to me, having sort, sort of a programming background, um, I, I, I find it very hard to create things in, in eToys. Well, can you say something about what, what's hard? Uh, I, I think the, the, struct, the, <coughs> the, sort of the structure of where, where to get started is hard. Oh, uh, where to where I can create behavior. I think you, you, you used it to, to quite a lot. It's kind of awkward to, to get the grip from us. Yes. I, if I compare it to the next, next uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. application here, yeah. Scratch is, is a tool developed by MIT, and I, think, I find that much easier to use and much yeah. mm -hmm. quicker to sort of get something going and, and uh, getting feedback and understanding what I'm, what I'm doing. So this is sort of has code templates uh, where you drag and drop little puzzle pieces uh, and you can see sort of exactly what can be changed. So you have parameters or, or like little fields that you can manipulate and you see they sort of plug into each other like, like, uh, like uh, Lego blocks. And you have a visual canvas here. So it's definitely geared towards making games and simple visual visualizations. Um, so it's not a generic tool in that sense. And then you have um, a more modern example of, of a Scratch called Hopscotch. It's an iPad app. It's very, it's a very dumbed down, simplified version of Scratch, but it's quite fun to use. Sort of when you, Martin, if you want to teach your game programming, it could be a, could be a first step. Um, it's very uh, different, very different approach to using your fingers to code actually. Um, Flash is an interesting uh, tool. It's sort of um, it's a tool you could use in very many many ways. You could use it as a drawing tool, an animation tool, or you could program in it, and you could actually do things that that was so, sort of in between. 
Um, I used Flash heavily when, when uh, a few years back, and um, uh, also sort of it wasn't uh, it it uh, it was a tool that cr demanded a lot of discipline if you want to create bigger applications. But it was really uh, interesting how you quickly you could sort of get things moving. And it, you still code. Uh, you code in a language similar to JavaScript, uh, or pretty much is JavaScript. Um, but you could also do things with a timeline, which is uh, the, the thing you see at the, at the top, where you could create behavior. You could sort of mix uh, timeline behaviors with code and so on. Um, so um, yeah, uh, interesting product. I'll mention a few flow-based systems, uh, just briefly. I, um, some of my favorites. Uh, one is Automator that comes bundled with every Mac computer. It's a very simple tool. Uh, you have a list of actions in the, in the left panel, and you have a sort of one-dimensional uh, list of, of uh, event list in the, in the right panel. So you can drag, uh, drag things uh, that should happen in, in sequence. And typical example is that you want to take a file as an input, and you want to maybe uh, change it to another format, and you want to rename it, and you want to name it, uh, and so on. You can create behaviors like that that runs on your computer locally. Yahoo Pipes uh, is an experimental application that Yahoo, Yahoo has created for creating web services, um, where you could take um, data from the web, um, an RSS feed or similar, parse that, sort it, and so on, and have an out output. Uh, quite fun to play around with. Uh, very hard to make complex applications as well. Uh, you, when you have more than 10 boxes on, on the screen, it becomes very hard to manipulate and understand what's going on. Going on. Um, also, which I'm looking forward to hear more about the Thomas uh, Blocky project, uh, it's not always evident where something goes wrong when you, when you, uh, it's hard to debug, uh, to say the least. Here's a final flow-based project that's interesting. It's uh, Legos, one of Legos' many programming language systems for, for the Mindstorms uh, robots. Um, so this, um, they have a very cute interface, uh, but it's quite powerful actually. As far as, I haven't used it myself, but what I've read and understood about it is actually, this is multiple, two uh, different threads running, so you can have a multi-thread application. These are loops, um, and, uh, and th these different building blocks are, are things that do something, that there's no coding involved, you change parameters in these blocks. Um, I like that there's subtle, nuances to this that I, I really like. Uh, I like them color-coded, uh, which I think is done, I think it's intentionally done so you can sort of get an overview for, for what the system is doing without sort of looking too much at the, at the details. Um, could actually be a bit too overly designed uh, with all the shadows and, and the sort of cuteness of it could be hard to maybe remove some of the, um, the that overview thing, but it's a, a neat system nevertheless. So I'm going to briefly mention what I'm working on, the project called Weld. And um, basically, the vision is to be able to prototype, build, and launch apps uh, without coding. And we want to ra radically make it easier to, uh, to make software. Um, and the uh, end vision is a tool that pr permits, uh, you basically drag and drop your, your user interface. You can iterate very quickly, you can sort of start with the structure, you can, you can uh, work on the visual design, and you can add interactivity, and you can sort of iterate that very quickly. Uh, and when you're done, it should, it should uh, have an, a functional app, not just a, a pro prototype or mock-up. And the types of interactivity we're, we're looking uh, at uh, implementing is, is the smart component system from Visual Basic, where basically we will wrap uh, functionality and components that you can drag and drop into your, your application. And then we will have a, a simplified flow scripting system, uh, a bit similar to Automator, actually. Um, and so that's the plan right now. 
And it might change actually, depending on what, what I learned tonight, but we'll see. The, the process we want to support is that you should have, be able to have an idea for an app. You can work on the structure of the application, that, that sort of uh, the functional uh, design of it. You can add the, an aesthetic layer to it, add the interactivity, and you can loop around in this as many times as you want. And you can have multiple people working on different aspects of it. Um, and <coughs> as you are working on it, there's a live web app. Uh, there's, there's a, from the from the minute you put your, your first sort of button on the canvas, you have a you have a URL that you can go in and, and click around in the app. And when you think you're done, you just sort of make that link public and, and the application is live. And if you want to bundle it, put it on the if you want to put it on, on an app store, you can bundle it as a iOS or or Android app. And since this is a quite complex project, we've taken three steps. So the first step, which is called Sketch, uh, probably we're releasing this uh, spring, it's more of a mock-up tool for, um, for interaction designers. So they can quickly create a design for, uh, for an app, and they have a link that they can send to a customer and they can, they can test it. The second version will be more of a web design tool, um, where we build on the Sketch app, we add more deeper, deeper um, design uh, features, and the, the possible the, we also add the feature to be able to export your, your app or your design as a as a web page. And then the final or or, or the, the version after that would be the <coughs> create version where, where you can actually add the interactivity to it. And that's it. If you want to sign up for our beta, please do uh, on our website. And we're on Twitter, Weld.io. And I'm open for any question you might have. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, one thing I'm thinking about is the, the visual versus text. OK, so you have text, like a, a source code file. Then in Smalltalk, it's more structured, so you have different panels with classes, methods, and so on. Yeah, you yeah, have like different, <coughs> like yeah. the, almost yeah. stops where you can find yeah, so it. it becomes a different way. It's still text, but mm -hmm. it becomes a different way. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then these uh, tools like Scratch and eToys, it's still text, but it's more of structured text. Yeah. So, so it's an interesting thing to to see and how uh, and like, like in Visual Basic you can attach behavior to buttons. Right. So you, you, you you can open up a button and write some code and so on. Yes. Yeah. So so it's uh, it's just a philosoph philosophical thing. I mean, well, well, what's uh, when does it become visual and what's the difference between? <laughs> I mean, it's a practical thing, but when you type text, you can easily do mistakes. And mm. eToys and Scratch, it's good for kids because you don't have to type that much. Mm. No, you, it, you cannot do syntax errors, essentially. No, exactly. I mean, in Scratch, you have like little, little values that yeah, are yeah. highlighted. Yeah. And Scratch is sort of somewhere in between where you have yeah. Yeah. the structure is given to you, but yeah. the, you can still have sort of chunks of code yeah. that you manipulate. Yeah. But but um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a part of making it uh, more yeah. user friendly to, to display. Yeah. You immediately see what you can manipulate and what you shouldn't manipulate. Yeah. Why why would you say that an, um, a visual approach is simpler than than text or code? This this aspect that we have mentioned is a big part of that. That you sort of um, uh, you you see what 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 is what is sort of the, the syntax or the or the formal rules of the system, and you see what what can be manip manipulated without um, damaging anything. That that's a big part. Um, I th but I think. Uh, Quicker feedback is uh, is a very important aspect as well. If you wanna 
Uh, and that's, that's more evident maybe in, in visual systems where, where you build some, something visual. But to be able to um, drag an element on, on screen from, from left to right and see that happening before your eyes, uh, instead of sort of experimenting with uh, X values in code, is, is a very, um, makes it very tangible and easier to use. Um, I can just fill in, it's very interesting, the, the question. And I think uh, on a like kind of physical level, you're actually uh, stepping up on what organizational level you are handling the problem. So, and that means when you're stepping up in an organizational level, you can handle more chaos uh, easier. That's kind of the, the way of evolution. A system gets kind of saturated with chaos, and either it uh, dies or it moves up a level in, in uh, organization, and then it handles chaos much easier. So I think that is the difference between text-based and, and flow-based, that you, you're, you're actually moving up. Raising the level of abstraction. Yeah, so exactly. So it's just, it goes right straight down to thermo, thermodynamics, the, <laughs> the concepts. Because I think it's quite inter interesting whether the visual approach introduces a trade-off when it comes to uh, the, the limitations of the systems. I mean, it's quite obvious in the visual basic case when you have a list of components and those are the only thing that you can use yeah. until you create your own components. Uh, and I think it's fairly obvious that that would limit the kind of things that you're, you're, you can produce with this system. Uh, would you agree that there is a trade-off in this uh, way? Yeah, I think every abstraction layer so, sort of um, uh, limits the possibility somewhat. I mean, uh, uh, stepping up from sort of machine code and upwards. Uh, but also, by, by uh, abstracting away some of the details, we can maybe focus on on, the, on larger aspects of, a, of an application or, or larger ideas, similarly to what Thomas was into, that um, we, we can maybe just uh, take some um, limits for granted. And I'm not saying this would apply for every application, uh, but but maybe for a lot of applications that, that uh, you, you don't really care about those details, you can you can move up and, and uh, spend more time on other aspects of the application. Yeah. Uh, don't we agree that that this this uh, that visual programming not necessarily raises the level of level of abstraction? I think it's many of these programs are just examples of another way of editing the code, basically, like Scratch, for example. It has the same very same constructs as you have, have in ordinary programming, just that you fill in the blanks instead of having having to write the syntax yourself. Yeah. It's not a higher abstraction le level, actually. All right. I think I was more into the flow based and so on. Mm. Like it. Yeah. But it, it's a bit like a command. If you type commands on the command line, compared to having a menu system. So mm. the menu system, it's more. You don't have to remember the commands. They are right in front of you. Yeah, it's more like more, it's easier to use, but it's not. It's still the same level of abstraction. Yes. 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 Mm. It's, yeah. It's the same. Yeah. yeah. But, but Scratch has other, I mean, all these tools I mentioned will, will have some, enforce some limit, limitations on you uh, compared to like a, like a freeform programming language. So, like in, in Scratch, you have the, you have the canvas, and I, I, I think you have, are limited to the amount of, I mean, you can't, you can't structure code in, in that many ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, it doesn't run to, if you want to write something completely different in, in Scratch, you run into a brick wall. Yeah. But all, all the design like limits your your options. I mean, that, that's kind of the point. Yeah. I mean, from the start, you have you can do anything, but that doesn't help you really. Yeah. You have to kind of choose something, and then the, then that will exclude some other things, of course. But. I agree. I mean, all tools do that. They, they both give you limits, but they give you possibilities. Like yeah. uh, if you get a hammer, you can't uh, you can't paint with it, but you can build beautiful things. Can I ask why you mentioned the little pipes mm -hmm. and um, that it becomes uh, fairly messy after uh, X number of components. Um, 
I was thinking, uh, I don't want to be impolite, but there is a problem, isn't there, with with this entire approach because it's been around for quite some time and still it hasn't taken off. So could could that be the problem that that there is no good way of of, of it doesn't scale in a certain sense? It, you you get the visual thing and it's nice up to a certain point and then it just becomes a horrible mess. So isn't that where uh, the problem is and that's the problem that needs to be solved for this entire approach to, to kind of progress? I, I think uh, you're right and I think there's definitely been uh, evolution since Yahoo Pipes. I think um, Thomas uh, has addressed the problem and, and uh, NoFlow, uh, another tool also that sort of allows you to uh, group functionality and, and uh, sort of into, into clusters and, and sort of zoom out even more. Uh, so you don't have to handle like a hundred of those tiny boxes with strings uh, at the same time. Mm -hmm. but, but I guess it's also a question of what you address. I mean, Yahoo Pipes is mainly for data processing as far as I understand. While some of the pro flow-based programming systems is for general logic flow as well. Yeah, but there is, is there really a difference? I mean, because I recognize this problem, for, as I said, for, from this HM system I used uh, in, in, in Magnet 5. Uh, up to a certain point of the length of the script, essentially, that you wrote, connecting up things up, it, it was perfectly handleable and it was nice. But then suddenly, when you reached another level, then just it just fell down. You had to kind of begin draw, drawing it, and still it was hard to, to keep, track, keep track of. Mm. So, so there is some kind of scalability issue here with this entire thing. So uh, that's why I'm also here to see, uh, to, to see what <coughs> has been done about this. But I guess as Tom said, it's also a user interface kind of. I think it's deeper than that. I think it's more conceptual. I think it's conceptual rather than just user interface. Well, I mean, I, I've been using this Lego thing in, in one of my courses, actually. Okay. And it's, it's quite interesting to see how that, first of all, you can do syntax error, basically, in, in this code. Oh. It's so advanced. <laughs> uh, because it has variables, and you access variables, and you draw these thin uh, pipes, basically. That's the flow of the variables, and you can draw them in the wrong way, and it's not really working. You, get, you do get uh, visual feedback immediately when you do it but you can definitely do things that doesn't sort of compile, so to speak. Okay. <laughs> but the next problem is, of course, um, uh, debugging or testing the software. Uh, because uh, I think we touched a little bit on, uh, I mean, I, I, my feeling is that when you write normal, write normal code is that uh, uh, when you write normal code, the, it gets quite messy when you start to need to take care of all the fault uh, situations that can arise. So you need to deal with everything that can go wrong, and you need to deal with it in the proper way. And then your code gets quite messy as well. And if you do that same thing in, in, in graphical programming, and you need to deal with all the faults, I think you, you still might have a problem. And uh, I, I, I don't know how to do this and how, how, how the, the say it will say that. I know that in the flow-based programming community, they used to point out that actually, for a lot of cases, it's much easier to test things because you can rewire the, the network anywhere. You can plug in a kind of a logging facility, a monitor, or a mock object or whatever at any point because it's, at least in flow-based programming, you're keeping the definition of the network separate so you can kind of rewire things at any time. And I saw some somebody, some Russian guy, he made a demo, he had some application where it was a graphical editing uh, system where you can actually, you could hover over the connections and see the video content flowing through at that time. <laughs> 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 so, kind of, yeah. so uh, I mean, I, I think there are ways to solve things, and, but surely there are things, ways to obscure things as well. Because that's, that's the other thing I was a bit confused. You called both this one, the Lego one, which you call it flow based, but also the one you're talking about, information flowing. So, I mean, there's two different types of flow, yeah. right? There's information flowing and there is execution flow. This yeah, execution I, I think flow. I'll cover a, a little bit of, of the difference. So, they're quite different, I would say. Mm. Yeah, there's some, sometimes a confusion of concepts. There's something used to call data flow, yeah. where it's more a general concept, and I think a lot of things go under that. And then there is a more specific flow-based programming, which I'm not sure, I haven't really checked into this system. I, I cannot tell you. So this is execution flow, whereas yeah. uh, this is information flow or data flow, uh, I guess. Yeah. 
and uh, this is also how you can mentioned flow. Yeah, but I, I, the, the flow-based programming inventor, he, he has some kind of few points that he suggests. And okay. I mean, but he, I mean, he's he's kind of liberal as well. I mean, he's, he's some systems that comply to yeah. some of them. He still call it flow-based. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's sometimes hard to know where, where to draw the line, but. What is the definition of flow-based programming? I'll come to that. So do, do you want to go up, go up next? Y yeah, sure. If, if we're not having a break or something, we'll talk something. Short break. Short break. Yeah. Break,